afternoon, everyone. My name is Mai, and I serve with our worship team here. And the teaching text today is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. This is the word of the Lord. Well, a very good evening to you. Uh, it's great to have you with us tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new and don't know me, uh, my name is John Tyson. I have the privilege of being uh, the senior pastor here. And uh, if you're just new to New York, great to have you. You're right on time. Uh, you've come at a, a good point uh, in the life of our church. We're about to start a 14-week series on discipleship, what it really means to follow Jesus. And uh, so I want to jump straight in tonight by giving you an overview about what our church is trying to do when it comes to the issue of discipleship. So there's just three things I want to do today. Number one, I just want to acknowledge the frustration many people have around the topic of discipleship. Number two, I want to tell you about a quote that's changed my life and changed the direction of our church. And then thirdly, I want to give you an invitation uh, into what it is we believe Jesus is doing uh, at this moment in history, uh, in particular in our church. So let's go. Frustration. I remember so clearly becoming a Christian, reading the Gospels for the first time and saying, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Signs, wonders, miracles, getting in fights with Pharisees, confronting Herod, starting a movement, revolution. This is incredible. No wonder so many people follow Jesus. And uh, I was just amazed. I would walk around saying to people, have you read the Gospels? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know what Jesus has done? Do you know how he lived? Do you know the power he had? Do you know the wisdom with which he taught? Have you ever looked at the life of Jesus? Several years into my relationship, I'm left scratching my head saying, where did all the stuff from the Gospels go in the church? Like, where, where's all the stuff that Jesus did in his life, his vision of discipleship, the things he taught and trained his disciples to do? Where did that get swallowed up or smothered out by the, by the modern church? We're left with some, like, okay programs, doing our best, a lot of activity, not a lot of transformation. I think there's a lot of folks sort of left shaking their heads. You read the Bible... It's like, this is mind-boggling. And then you show up to do the Christian life, and you're like, this is not mind-boggling. And there's a huge tension there. And I think I've, I've seen a few reasons as a pastor why people can be frustrated about discipleship. One reason is that a lot of folks, um, they just basically keep living their selfish lives before they met Jesus, but they they put some spirituality around that life. Here's my little formula for it. Consumer spirituality that says God exists to make your life better, plus self-care, and uh, self-care is better than self-harm, and there's a lot of folks who don't care about anybody, so I'm not, I'm not anti-self-care. But then some Jesus-y practices sprinkled on top of self-care and selfish spirituality, it doesn't produce what we see in the Gospels. Sometimes uh, people get frustrated because you get really, really serious about following Jesus and you look around and you're like, let's go all in. And people are like, yes, for three and a half months and then like, peace, we're out. Have you ever experienced that? They, some, something happens where people lose their passion, lose their zeal, lose their joy. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 11, where he talks about the second soil, where the, the, the seed of the gospel of the kingdom comes into a person's life and it says they receive it once with joy. But because they don't get rooted under pressure when things get hard, it says they quickly fall away. Have you ever been running along in church and then look to your left and be like, what happened to them? So, man, they just, they fell away. The discipleship didn't get rooted and grounded. Sometimes people get worried, and I'm very sympathetic to this, they get worried about anybody that is making a strong demand for their commitment. There's been so much church hurt, so many abuses with uh, church hierarchy and power, that anytime someone is like, follow me, let's go, they're like, and who are you? And I don't think so. There's a lot of suspicion, or if nothing else, there's just 
there's just a fatigue of leadership abuses and failures. And so a lot of times people are like, I want to give myself to something. I just don't know if I can trust the church. Bonhoeffer says this, a false faith is capable of terrible and monstrous things. Jesus saved his strongest critiques, not for sinners, but for the religious leaders of his day. Do you remember what he said to the Pharisees? He says, you cross land and sea to make a single convert. Like your zeal for discipleship is extraordinary. But when you get your hands on them and you disciple them, you turn them into twice as much a son of hell as you are. Now, you know what those are? Fighting words, okay? This is Jesus critiquing the most powerful religious leaders in his world. And he tells them, your form of discipleship, is it turns people into children of hell. And then sometimes there's false discipleship. Jesus said in John's gospel, uh, if you remain in my teachings, or if you remain in my word, you're really my disciples. And sometimes it can be disillusioning. I feel this a lot. A lot of folks sort of just, they get rid of what Jesus taught. And so they have a discipleship, but it's just basically secular humanism with Christian language on top of it. They sort of let Jesus' controversial or challenging teachings go. And you, you remember Thomas Jef Jefferson, one of the founding fathers, he came up with the Jefferson Bible, where he cut out all the passages of the New Testament that he thought really mattered. And uh, so he had the Jefferson Gospel. And it was just all the stuff he liked about Jesus made in his own image. And a lot of times, that's what people do. They go to the Bible, they cut out all the parts they don't like, and they disciple themselves under something they feel comfortable with. That's not it. So it can be disappointing. You read the beauty of who Jesus is, the wonder of what he offers us in the gospel. You look around at church, life, faith, and discipleship, and you're like, what happened? And often this can be discouraging. And here's what I want to say to you tonight, okay? It's quite simple. The reason your heart says there has to be more than this is because there is more than this. A lukewarm, half-hearted, shallow, watered-down faith is not what God has in mind for you. And I promise that if you are aching for a wholehearted discipleship, you're going to meet a wholehearted God who is willing to train you and equip you and prepare you. So do not give in and do not give up and do not lose heart. A lot of people frustrated. Now, what about this quote here that quote unquote changed the direction of our church? Well, let's, it, it, Dallas Willard better be good. Here's what he says. Every church ought to ask two questions. What is our plan for making disciples? And is that plan working? You know, I've, I've been a, a pastor for a long time now, 26 years, and I've never once, this is kind of crazy, I'm always amazed at the things people ask me when they're new to the church, and I'm always amazed at the things nobody ever asks me when they join a church. And I've never had a person sit me down and say, hey, I've been coming for a while, I'm really interested. I'd like to know what your vision is for forming our church into radical disciples of Jesus. No one's ever asked me that. Isn't that wild? People have asked, like, what's, you know, how do I get in a small group? It's an important question. People have asked what our church believes on LGBTQ issues or women in ministry or politics or any number of cultural issues. But no one has seemed to sit down and say, hey, does your church have a plan to make disciples and be? Are you guys any good at it? I'm about to entrust my life to you, and I just want to know if you guys know what you're doing. It's an, it's an interesting thought, but I think it's really, really true the church is only as good as the disciples it makes. You can have great teaching and have bad disciples. You can have great programs, incredible facilities, and still have bad disciples. Uh, you can have all, all the, you can have worship that will stir your soul. But if people don't know how to follow Jesus in real life, we're not doing what we're called to do. Dallas Willis said the word disciple occurs almost 270 times in the Bible, Christian occurs three times, and it's only because they're trying to categorize disciples. So the, the Bible is a book about disciples for disciples to help us get better at discipleship. So what is a disciple? Let's just sort of ask this question. Really, It's a student, it's a follower, it's a learner. It's a Greek word, mathetes. It means someone who is submitting themselves to somebody else to learn from them, okay? It's not like a follower on social media, 
where it's just like, I follow you. It's like, great. Um, and by that we mean I occasionally see random details from your life. That is not what Jesus had in mind for discipleship. Like, oh, I saw a little thing you did in Mark 11 there. I kind of like that. Anyway, back to me. No, this is a wholehearted submission to learn from him. Both of my children, uh, raised here in Manhattan, both of my children have black belts in Taekwondo. Uh, my favorite ever, my, my daughter was, <laughs> was doing violin lessons with someone from Juilliard. And um, in a, my favorite photo is, is her doing violin in a... In a like in a gi with a black belt. And uh, when we went, I went and watched her that night and the instructor, I'll never forget his words, his amazing words. He says, everybody, everybody fight like Haley. This is a ballet of violence, a ballet of violence. Sweet little Haley, she's so tiny, fierce. Now here's what I was doing. I was investing uh, in the future dating lives of both of my children with the black belts in Taekwondo. I was investing in late night uh, commutes. Um, but when they went into this little dojo, I don't even know what they call it anymore, what do they call them? Dojo? Whatever. They went to this school of uh, Taekwondo, okay? They didn't walk in and be like, hey, listen, I just need you to know something. I'm not comfortable with belts, so I was wondering if you guys have patches. It's like, dude, we're doing belts. We're going to slap you with a belt when you graduate from one belt to the next. They didn't come in and tell the instructor, well, I know that you've got like a tradition that's a couple hundred years old or whatever, but I've really had a fresh few thoughts lately on punching and, uh, and I just, so I'm, I want to do it my way. No, they came in as white belts and humbled themselves and they learned. And when they'd learned enough as a white belt, they went through a test and became a yellow belt. And, when they, and they went all the way through to black belt. And so here's my simple process. Discipleship is more like that than it is doing whatever you want. It's not like getting a, lo a life coach who just sort of acts as a chaplain for you to do your thing well. It's a submission to learn how to live in the way of Jesus. Learning from Jesus, a disciple submits himself to follow Jesus. Disciples learn Jesus' words. It's, it's amazing uh, how many times I read the Gospels and I'm like, I didn't know that Jesus said that. I've, now, I've read that 400 times, but I just missed that. The other morning, I was reading this, this, I'd never seen this. I used this in a sermon, but some of you weren't here. Here it comes again. We're waiting. You know, you know that voice where Jesus is getting baptized and it says, the heavens open. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. In Luke's gospel, it says, while he was praying, the heavens opened. And some of us are waiting for a voice from heaven, but we're not in a conversation with heaven. While he was praying, heaven opened. How many times I've preached through that gospel? I, never, I missed that. We've got to get Jesus' words into us. We've got to, if we're going to be like the master, we've got to know what the master said. Then we need to practice uh, what Jesus taught as a, a way of ministry. A disciple imitates Jesus' life and character. A disciple finds and teaches other disciples of Jesus. Look, here's the truth. Our church is not how good it is for you to come back. Our church is how good your discipleship is for you to make disciples of Jesus outside of our church. It's a different issue. So if all we've done is created something you want to be a part of without equipping you to reproduce what God's done in your life, we haven't fulfilled our mission. Now, here's a challenge. People have so many opinions about discipleship. And people have so many opinions about how to fix the church. And a lot of times people have the, the magic bullet theory. They're like, oh, listen, here, listen, trust me. I'm here to restore the whole church. Great. What is it? I've got this one thing. Now, I love when it's, it's every person is on a journey of spiritual, psychological, and emotional development. And sometimes when you move from one stage to another stage, you can dismiss your previous stage like it didn't matter and think that your new stage is the stage of all stages. But one of the things about getting old, and I am getting old, one of the things about getting old is you start to get some, some distance and understanding that a lot of this is just a person's journey, and it's beautiful. I champion it. I never want to dismiss zeal or passion in particular areas. But over the course of time, you begin to realize it's actually not one thing. It's going to be multiple things. And uh, I'm, I'm always moved. I've never done it, and I never plan to. I have zero CrossFit goals in my life, but... Every year I watch the CrossFit Games documentary. It's, just, it's incredible. I'm super inspired to watch it again next year. 
what I love theoretically about CrossFit is they say if, if you're really strong but you've got no cardio, you're not fit. And then they say if you're really jacked, you look amazing, but you're not flexible, you're not fit. And the genius of CrossFit was they took six or seven disciplines and integrated them together with the vision of fitness. And what I love about it, it's called the world's fittest person. And a lot of times people have a one-dimensional approach to discipleship, which is just, you got to have the Bible, you got to have the Bible. I love the Bible. But if it's only the Bible, you're not going to be spiritually fit. You're going to be a one-dimensional Christian. A lot of times people are like, you've got to have the power of God, you've got to be Pentecostal. I love the Holy Spirit. But it's going to take more than just the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Because the Corinthians had the Holy Spirit. They were terrible, terrible. Paul says to the Corinthians, you're lacking in no spiritual gift. In fact, I don't even have to teach you about these things. Also, stop having sex with the steck mum. Kick him out of church. Hand him over Satan to Satan to get uh, the deeds of his flesh destroyed. So the whole, all you need is to get filled with the Holy Ghost is not enough here. There's no magic bullet, okay? And one of the things you learn is that I think you get a little bit older. What really works most of the time is an integrated approach. It's taking the best of many things and holding them together to get this right, an integrated vision. Now, I'll try and give you an analogy here, which actually made me laugh from what happened between this morning and this evening. Um, my wife likes to watch The Great British Bake Off. Is that the name of the show? Okay, so I've never watched more than two minutes of it, Okay. But it's on a lot. It's on a lot at our place. I'm reading Leslie Newbegin about how to bring Western culture into an authentic missionary encounter. And my wife is uh, figuring out how to make cakes. And I honestly believe this is the perfect kingdom partnership. Okay? <laughs> it was so interesting. I came home today and I was like, Baze, please tell me you cooked something good. And you know what she pulls out of the oven? Kale chips. I was like, what? This has <laughs> never happened in my life. You go through my notes. Anyway, there was no cake today. There was kale chips. Anyway, she normally bakes cakes, desserts. She's incredible. She'll throw a little berry galette down. That is so mind-boggling. I'm like, how did that even happen? Anyway, I am the least patient, the least patient uh, person when it comes to waiting for the finished product. So I'm always just in the kitchen like... Oh, what have we got? Oh, got some ingredients here. She's got it all measured out. I'm like, butter. I love butter. I put butter in my coffee. I'm not doing CrossFit, but I am doing Bulletproof Coffee. I'm over here, butter coffee. Oh, that's incredible. What sugar? I'm just do a little, oh, my fingers are already wet from the butter. Let's do a little sugar, a little dip. Each of the ingredients, and she's always like, would you just wait? This is not it. And I always listen, when she goes into the bathroom, I literally will run into the oven, get a little spoon, just be like, fucking incredible, and then try and smooth it over like I didn't get caught, come back. She always knows, she has a sense. John, what, nothing, I didn't do it. Here's what she would do, she would say, listen, I know you appreciate the ingredients on their own, just let me put them together in the right portion. Let me put this in the oven and cook this for you. Let me put the icing on it and bring you a cake. Stop, stop snacking on the individual ingredients. Let me bring them together. Now, I say all that to say, I think a lot of times the best kind of discipleship is when all of these individual ingredients come together in the right kind of atmosphere and environment with the right amount of time to produce something that is so much better than anything or any individual ingredient on its own. Our church calls this becoming a compelling missional disciple. This is our vision for you. When I close my eyes, when I pray that great prayer, the apostolic prayers, Ephesians 1, Ephesians chapter 3, when I'm praying for our church, I'm praying this, Lord, make our people disciples of Jesus. Lord, make them missional, make them about the kingdom of God. Make their lives compelling. One of the greatest sins of the modern church is to take the beauty and wonder of the person of Jesus, the most extraordinary person who's ever lived and make it boring for an entire generation. I want to follow Jesus in such a way that people are like, I want to stop sinning because I want what you've got in your life. Something compelling. So, as we mentioned the area, our, ch our church feels like these core ingredients or these disciplines that come together fit in three categories. The first one is the tangible presence of God. 
The second one is counterformation, which is really about the disciplines of walking with Jesus and having a character change and then sacrificial mission. Now, let's get that slide up here, okay? I want to explain this to you. It's a touch complex, but I want you, next slide. I want you to, I want, that's the slide, okay. <laughs> it's a long way back there, okay? Um, a lot of folks are just, they're all about, and I see this all the time. Someone grows up like in a Presbyterian church or a Baptist church or whatever. They get on the internet, they watch a prophetic conference or they listen to a worship thing. And they're like, did you know that God still moves today? I'm like, yes. They're like, no, do you know? And I'm like, yes, I know. And they're like, it's so good. They get so caught up in a fresh encounter with God. They think the only thing that matters is the tangible presence of God. And then sometimes, and if, if you get that, it, sometimes this leads to hyper-spirituality. And these people end up being more spiritual than Jesus, Paul, and the rest of the apostles. Paul's like, hey, Timothy, I know you've got a weak stomach, man. He doesn't say, I release an apostolic decree over your inner being right now. You know what he says? Have some wine, mate. Got a weak gut? It's probably the bacteria. You need to get a little wine. Be hyper spiritual. Paul would do miracles, and then Paul went and made tents, not super glamorous. So I believe in principalities and powers. I believe in angels, demons, signs, wonders, glory, and even gold dust. Okay, I got a category for all of that, but it's not enough. It's important, but it's insufficient on its own. Then counterformation. Uh, I think this is really important, but you do get some people, particularly you see this a lot, they come from the Pentecostal camps and they're like, dude, I just can't do a four-hour sermon. And so they become Lutheran or they become Anglican. And then they're like, it's super liturgical, it's rich, it's historical, it's meaningful, it's not rooted in the pastor's opinion, it's proven through history. And then the, their journey goes from what God's doing out there to this deep inner journey. And this journey is often about my own formation and and I love this stuff. Man, this stuff's changed my life. I'm a charismatic contemplative. Uh, I can't get enough time on my own. I love the idea of attending to my heart. But sometimes if this is all you do, you don't, if this doesn't just become a season or a part of your faith, it becomes your whole faith. It becomes a kind of spiritual narcissism. It can become just kind of an inward focus, perpetual obsession with how you're doing. And then sometimes if you get sacrificial mission over here, you get people who are all about serving the poor, all about repairing the world, all about seeking justice. But sometimes this just look we do it with the same spirit that the world does it. And so it takes on a kind of anger and bitterness. It loses the sweetness of enemy love. And uh, so much modern justice, uh, it has a right to be angry, but it has no tools for healing. And even the civil rights, the, the genius of the civil rights was that it was, it was all built on the Old Testament prophets and enemy love from Jesus, and we've lost that. And so, so often you see a kind of defiant self-righteousness that can step into these things. A lot of times people try and get two out of three, and so if you get tangible presence and counterformation, you can sort of end up with a spiritual selfishness like, man, I'm having an amazing time with God and He's changing me so deeply. But you can forget about the world is bleeding out outside of it and you're doing nothing about it. Sometimes you can be really moved internally about what God's doing and really care about the world, but you lose sight of God. And this becomes your vision of justice. And this just looks for the most part like social activism that anybody who doesn't know Jesus can do. And then sometimes you get people who are all about glory and wonder and serving the world, but the characters never form. And so many ministries collapse inwards because there wasn't enough inner formation. And so we really think that the best of these things, the, the sort of the, the missional tradition, the charismatic tradition, the contemplative tradition, when these things come together, the right ingredients in the right environment, something really beautiful happens. I want to take one second to just double, double click on these, take these just a little bit uh, deeper. The reason we need God's tangible presence in our life is because without Jesus, we are spiritually dead. That's what the Bible says. It says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. It says that we're children of wrath. It says we're enemies of God. And so if you're waiting for somebody to just sort of one day on their own discover Jesus, they're never going to. It always requires 
the pursuing love of the Holy Spirit to wake that person up from their sleep. Um, I've been really focusing on my sleep, okay? I've, I've got sleep tape now. I'm like taping my mouth up, breathing through my nose. Andrew Huberman is my mentor. And um, the thing, I've been having the deepest sleep of my life. It's incredible. I'm not, I'm not getting any pay for the sleep tape or whatever. It's changed my life. <laughs> my wife was up the whole night and got hospitalized, and I slept through it. She said, I didn't want to wake you. I was like, you didn't. <laughs> I was out. I got the. The thing about being asleep is you don't know you're asleep when you're asleep. Have you noticed that when you're asleep? You're just like, you're out. When I wake up, I'm like, what did I miss? Christy, where are you? Nate's taken into the hospital. What's even happening? And uh, here's the thing. When you're spiritually dead, you're not aware that you're spiritually dead. You feel alive, but you're dead. And so it takes an in-breaking of the manifest presence of God. There's a difference between the manifest presence the, or the tangible presence of God and the omnipresence of God. One of the attributes, one of the omni-attributes of God is that God is everywhere. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the wicked and the good. There's that sort of terrifying but also comforting psalm where David says, where can I go from your presence? And the first part of that psalm is he's kind of terrified, like he's like, if I, I can't even get away from you to sin in secret. But then he realizes it's comforting because even if he goes to the depths of hell, he's not going to be outside of the love of God. But non-Christians have the exact same access to the omnipresence of God as Christians do. And so everybody is living in the presence of God right now. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who dwell in it. So this is God's world. These are God's people, whether they know it or not. The tangible presence of God, the manifest presence of God, is when a person wakes up to the reality that God is there. You remember Jacob, he says, sure, he calls it Bethel. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. He's having that a moment of awareness, which is what I'm going to speak on, spiritual awareness, next week. So I, I want you to see this. The thing that marks out disciples of Jesus is they have an awareness of the reality of the presence of God in their lives. Christians aren't people who just have a Christian worldview. They they're, they're more than just those who believe certain creeds. They're people who are living in the reality and intimacy of life with God. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send my spirit. Jesus says, it's better that I leave than if I stay because the Holy Spirit is going to be so intimate with you. Jesus says, I'm with you. He's going to be in you. This is an extraordinary sense of promise. Exodus 33 in the Old Testament the children of Israel are struggling to get the slavery out of them after 400 years in Egypt. They rebel against God, and God says, right, I'm going to start again with you, Moses. Then Moses ends up saying, look, if you don't get this, I don't want to go. He says, it's your presence that marks us out from all the other people on earth. Now, I've thought about this. In a place like New York, there's a million ways to mark out your community. You can put a flag up, and everyone will know you're a part of a certain community. You can dress in a certain way and people know you're a part of a certain community. You can have a language different from somebody else and that will let people know I'm a part of a different community. You can go to a different neighborhood and uh, people will have different kinds of foods or different kinds of businesses. There's a million ways you can say to somebody, we are building a sociological category of differentiation. The children of Israel did this. Circumcision is a good start. Dietary restrictions, also a strong start. Moral law, strong start. Moses is like, it's none of those things. I don't want sociological differentiation. I want divine presence. And if you don't show up as God with us, I don't want to go. This is meant to be a distinctive. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul makes the case that church should be the place where when an unbelief comes in, they say, sure, the secret of my heart's being revealed. This was Kitty's story. I didn't tell anybody about this word pride or whatever. And I feel like there's a God up there who sees my heart and knows me intimately. This is how I became a Christian. I didn't become a Christian because um, but someone shared a traditional gospel. I ended up believing that. I became a Christian because I had all of these things I was wrestling with in my heart. I didn't feel like there was a single person I could talk to them about. On a youth camp, the youth pastor says, John Tyson, stand up, I have a word from God for you, and then reads my mail to me. And I just remember thinking, holy crap, this thing is real. Look, I've never shared that with anybody. How could he know? How could he know? 
That's what happens when God shows up in your midst. Listen, you were designed by God to walk in intimacy with Him. You were designed to know the Holy Spirit as a person. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. You're designed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, move in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. Read God's word and have it come alive and speak to you. You're designed by God to have power to overcome sin. You are meant to live in the tangible presence of God, not just the omnipresence of God. Second thing, counterformation. There's a, there's a myth that people have in the world today. It's like, oh, imagine being a Christian and like submitting to someone and letting them train you. <laughs> It's like, listen, everybody's being discipled by somebody. A lot of people being discipled by TikTok. The TikTok is not a good mentor, friends. I'm not anti-TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. I am, but I'm not active. Is that what you say? I don't know. Whatever. Uh, My point is we're so influenced. We're following everybody. Why do you wear what you wear? You saw someone, I was like, I'll have some of that. You, you, you've built a fashion based on observing other people. So we have to realize that there's no such thing as non-discipleship. There's only choosing who you're going to let influence you. The Bible says um, that apart from Jesus, that we're not just like a little bit, like sin is not just like I've got a bit of a cold in my soul. Sin is like stage four cancer that you cannot recover from. It's spiritual death. It's a condition you cannot heal yourself from. It's to fall short of the glory of God. It leaves you with a glory deficit that you long to get. Affirmation, relationships, sexuality, money. All to fill the deficit that you're not enough. That's what sin is. It's falling short of the glory of God. So if we're going to, and it has a profound impact on us, look at how it deforms us. This is what Paul says to the Ephesians, talking about what they used to be like. They are, and let's put the one up with the orange uh, quotes. I think it's the next one. Next, that one. Um, They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. These, These are strong phrases. Indulging in impurity, giving ourselves over to sensuality, darkening our understanding, separated from the life of God, ignorant, hard and hearts. And this spiritual deformation ends up wounding us, filling us with lies, creating idols. That, next slide idols that we worship, addiction practices, systems that we get stuck in, under the control of Satan, slaves to ourselves, and caught in sin. But Paul's going to go on in the next verse and then talk about counterformation and how Jesus changes this out of that. Look at it. It says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ. I, mean, I think it's... Keep going. <whistles> next. Keep going. Can we have a round of applause for whoever's doing our slides back there? They're in another room. They're in another room. So this is what Paul's going to say. That, however, is not the way you learned. Uh, That's not the way of life you learned. It's a way of life. When you heard about Christ and were taught in Him, accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitudes of your mind, to put on the new self, created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. So the great work of formation is to make sure that we're being transformed out of the way of the world, out of our brokenness, into the image of Jesus. Where there was wounds, there's healing. Where there was lies, there's truth. Where there was idols, there's worship. Where there was addiction, there's freedom. Where there was excess, there's self-control. Where there was the world, there's the kingdom. Where there was Satan, there's Jesus. Our false self becomes a true self. Sin is let go, we experience righteousness. That's good news for your heart. And then ultimately, this leads us to a sense of mission. We're walking and enjoying the reality of life in the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, intimacy with Jesus. We're being deeply changed at the deepest part of who we are, and then we move out into the world on mission. This has sort of four fronts of mission, spiritual, social, cultural, and global. We care about those who don't know Jesus. Who Listen, the more I talk with people, the more blown away I am by how hard life is for people in the modern world. We're walking around like everyone's just doing great. People are hurting. People are struggling. People are overwhelmed. People are riddled with anxiety. People have such a low sense of worth. 
we're almost like, well, I don't want to embarrass them by talking to them about Jesus. I find people talking my ear off in public because they don't have anybody who will listen to them. People are in desperate need of love and care, so we should care about them. We need to care about what happens with the society that we live in. Social justice is an important compa- uh, component. Each of us should be figuring, what do I have? What's God given me? And how do I work to make a more just world that looks like the kingdom of God? All of us should be memorizing passages like Isaiah 58. This is the fast that I see. We want the, the church wants to recover its sense of righteousness and influence. It says your light will break forth when you really begin to care about the poor. Culture. A lot of times people think that their job doesn't matter. You know, your job is like where you make the money to give to the church. This is wrong. Your job is the primary way you bring the kingdom of God into the world. You've got to have a sense of vocational calling. You've got to figure out how your job is moving towards uh, the kingdom of God in our world. And we need to care about what God's doing around the world. You know, you know this, but this is where God's called us, but this isn't where the action is. Go to Iran. You want the action? Go to Iran. Go to the underground church in China. Go down to Central America and see what God's doing there. We've got to be connected to the global church and care about God's kingdom coming in all of the world. Now, if I could get you to just get one idea in your head about mission, to shake you from your current reality into this, it would be this. It's the idea of the redemptive edge. Now, I've used this so many times but all the communicators say, when you say it seven times, people go, oh, that was a good idea. Never heard it. Some of you, it's your first time, so welcome to the redemptive edge, okay? The redemptive edge. I've spent so much time asking the question, why do people get bored with their faith? Why do they get bored with their faith? Okay, so here's my answer to it. There's a continuum of missional engagement with the world that Jesus loves, okay? Comfort, concern, caution criticism and darkness. This is moving you closer to what Jesus is doing in the world. There's a line here I want to call next slide the redemptive edge. And the redemptive edge, next slide, is where most of Jesus' mission happened. Have a look at this. Jesus lived in a place of almost constant criticism. He's eating with sinners. Makes everybody angry. Ang- angry. Okay, spends, <laughs> spends time with women. Makes people angry. Critiques the Pharisees' uh, traditions. Makes people angry chooses the wrong disciples, makes people angry. Says discipleship is too costly, makes people angry. Brings the wrong people in. Everybody's criticizing Jesus, but it gets worse. Jesus doesn't say, oh, let me go back down to a place of comfort where I'm dealing and doing things that you all already affirm. Jesus starts moving even further into the darkness. Next slide. Jesus goes to Samaria, the place that good Jewish people would never go. Jesus goes to the Decapolis, which many scholars believe was the faraway land the prodigal son ran to. Jesus goes there twice. Jesus is on the road to Emmaus when his disciples are walking away from him. Jesus sends the Great Commission, isn't stay in Jerusalem, build a sweet neighborhood, and go deep together. Jesus is like, get to the ends of the earth. The book of the Acts is the gospel going into places of increasing darkness. And church history, the church is at its best when it's reaching in the darkness to bring the light. Now, most, next slide, most modern disciples should be set up right here, which is like, I really like what I'm doing, and just a little touch of uh, excitement, just a touch, you know, just making people slightly nervous. Here's what Leslie Newbegin says, the deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is. And where is he? On the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. Most discipleship, It's boring because Jesus isn't doing much there. I think Jesus is looking at most people in their comfort and being like, I'm bored too, dude. I don't, come on, come on. So the goal of discipleship and mission is to close that gap between American comfortable Christianity and where it is that Jesus is really working. Now, here's the good news, ready? The beauty of New York. You don't have to go on some missions trip. You just have to go to Ninth Avenue. I mean, it's right here. There is so much heartbreaking need around us. All you got to do is be awake and have courage to lean into it. Compelling missional disciples, that's our heart for you. So I want people who have transformed minds, 
Believing what Jesus believed. Transform character, becoming like Jesus. Transform relationships, loving as Jesus loved. Transform practices, living as Jesus lived. Transform service, ministering as Jesus ministered. Transform influence, leading as Jesus led. Now, listen, I'm aware that at this point, it probably sounds like I'm asking you to quit your job, raise money full time so that you can pray nine hours a day and then meditate quietly on your own evilness and then serve the poor and then raise the dead and then do a lot of mission trips, okay? So some of you right now are like, well, that, I can't do that. But I was, at an, uh, I was at a party last night, a farewell party uh, in the Upper West Side for a, a guy named Will. It's, it, Will's here somewhere tonight. It's, yeah, there's Will. Uh, Will rolled into our church and started believing in our church when there wasn't that much to be a part of or believe in. You know when people show up and they're like, I quite like it here, and I'm like, Really? I mean, no, I've, I've, of course, I'm, 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 I love it too. Really? And uh, I, was just, I was just thinking, next slide here, a little close up. Um, I was just thinking, Will's getting ready to go back to London after you know, a glorious seven-year run here in New York, going back to London. And I, I, I want to use him as an example of a compelling mission or disciple because many of you will leave here in a few years. And I, just want, I want you to see the kind of legacy that's possible if you lean in. So I'm looking, I'm thinking about Will's story, and our church is like, man, we've got to rally people to mission. So we wrote this course called the Missional Life Course. I was like, we don't, I want to debut this course, and, um, and Will's like, I'll help with that. And I forgot, not only was he in it, he hosted it in his apartment, so that was a good start. And then it was like, hey, man, we need to, we need to figure out how to reach non-believers. Like, we've, we've got Alpha going, it's going okay, but we need help. And he's like, well, very humbly, very British, very humbly. Well, you know, I... I did work for Nicky Gumbel, you know, uh, who sort of popularized Alpha on planet Earth, okay? And uh, so direct ask us to the guy that sort of scaled it. And so he helped us get Alpha up and running. Um, and then we needed leadership coaching for our leaders. And he says, well, no, help, I'll help design like a leadership coaching thing. And then we needed help in small groups. And he says, well, I'll run a small group. And, and I was going through all the areas of our church. I need help with prayer. Well, I'm happy to, to pray for people. And I was just like... There's barely an area of our life that doesn't have his fingerprints on it. I went to his farewell parties, a bunch of people I knew, a bunch of people I didn't know. I was like, what an impact. And you're like, wow, that's what happens when you work at a church. The thing is, Will works at Google, the Google. So he's like, he, he didn't do all of this. He did all of this while working at a job at a not that easy to work out place. And he did all of this out of a vision, just saying, Lord, here's my life. Use my life. I want to be a part of this work you're doing. And I want to tell you, some people leave the city, and sadly, all they did was pursue their own dreams, struggle, and then go somewhere else cheaper. And some people say, I want to pour my life out and make a difference. And they leave with farewell parties where people pray over them for hours and thank them because they've poured themselves out. And it was just such a beautiful reminder to be a compelling mission of disciples, not to drop out of life and be a monk. It's to show up in your life wholeheartedly with a vision of what it is that God wants to do. Listen, you are the perfect candidate. You, not me. Yes, you, the perfect candidate to be a compelling mission of disciple. Okay, last thing here, an invitation. An invitation. Most of Jesus, you know how discipleship starts? It's not a trick question here, okay? When you read the Gospels, discipleship starts when you meet Jesus and he says, leave what you're doing and follow me. That's it. It's not, no, no trick question. Discipleship starts by saying yes to Jesus' invitation. Look what happens in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew uh, chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up. And followed him. That's how discipleship starts. And you know how Matthew's life ends? Church historians are not exactly clear, but he dies a martyr. He goes to Ethiopia, preaches the gospel, and is killed for his faith. And how did, how did his wife, do you think Matthew was like, you know what I'm thinking about doing? I'm thinking about being one of the founding apostles of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm thinking about getting my own book and popping it in the Bible. You think he had any idea of the history-shaping influence that was going to come for his life? Here's what he knew. 
He was a social outcast. He had sinned against his people. He had a shame-filled identity. Jesus said, let's go. And he said, okay, this is an upgrade. I'm with you. And that's how discipleship works. And it changed his life. He said yes to a person. He said yes to a new life. He said yes to deep meaning and significance. So I want you to understand this. To say yes to Jesus is to upgrade your life in every conceivable way. The biggest lie, this is the thing that held me back from Jesus for so long. I was like, I don't, I don't want to give up what I've got. And I look back on it now and I'm like, what you had? What you had? You thought that was better than what Jesus can give you? Man, Jesus has been so kind to me. I had no plans to come to America, marry a hottie, have great kids, live up here. This is not in some, this was not on my little bucket list that I'm trying to check off, making me those kale chips, okay? This is not, this is not what I saw coming. But when you, say, so when you say no to Jesus, you limit yourself to your options. When you say yes to Jesus, you say yes to every available option in the kingdom of heaven. Trust me, it's better than what you can do. Here's a picture. Uh, this is a painting. Uh, this is a calling of St. Matthew by uh, Caravaggio. It's in a little chapel in Rome. I love this image. This image is so rich. I want to just zoom in a touch. Here you've got a man sitting at a table. Jesus is in the shadows. Actually, let's go to the next one so people can see who's who. Um, here's Christ calling Matthew. And here's Matthew sitting at a table. And I love this image so much. Jesus goes and talks to a kind of person that nobody would ever want to talk to. And he says to him, Matthew, do you want a different life? And he says, follow me. Now, there's so much happening in this painting that is absolutely beautiful. If you zoom, zoom in and look at Jesus' hand in this picture, what Caravaggio has done is taken God's hand that Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel, and here's what he's saying. Here is God in human flesh reaching out to you. I love this, but Matthew, Matthew's not sure. So God is reaching out, but Matthew's not reaching back. He's unsure. So then the next thing happens, it's absolutely amazing. He uses the finger of God from the Sistine Chapel, but he uses Adam's hand. He uses Adam's hand. And what he's saying is that Christ is understood as the second Adam. And so he's saying, listen, Matthew, you don't have to save yourself. You don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to come up with this yourself. He'll do it for you. All you've got to do is say yes. And so you've got this beautiful scene, and I love this. Look at Matthew's face, how he's been painted here. He's, next slide. He's sitting here like he's got his hand on his chest like, have you ever been in that moment when, when someone's like you're in Central Park and someone's waving and you're just kind of like, did we do Alpha together four years ago and I've forgotten? I, and you don't want to turn around. And uh, if you do, just walk away like nothing's happening. But you're just like, are they, are they talking to me? It's just like that sense of uncertainty. Why would you be talking to me? And here he is, and he's just unsure. Jesus, do you mean me? I'm a tax collector. I'm an enemy of my people. I'm a traitor. I'm an outcast. Certainly, you're not thinking that I'm going to be one of the people you used to build your kingdom. And he's got this moment of self-doubt. Next slide here. And he's got a choice he has to make. If you look closely, he's got his finger saying, is it me? And he's got one hand on the tax collection. He's got his hand on his money. This is his security. This is what he betrayed his people for, was for the money. And, he's, and, and, and his whole destiny is going to come down to two questions. Jesus, did you mean me? And Jesus is saying, will you let that go and trust me? Here's his whole life hanging in the balance right now. What will the answer be? And the most amazing thing, Matt's like, you can keep this. And he gets up from the table. And I love this phrase. It says, he got up and he followed him. He got up and he followed him. Listen, you're the one that Jesus wants to use to be a disciple. Yeah, yeah you. You, not someone else. Dude, last year, I, this, this is hypothetical. This is not me now. This is me pretending to be your voice. I want to clarify that for what I'm about to say. Okay, Dude, last year, I got online, hooked up with a bunch of people. I was struggling. I was lonely. It was a bad place. God can never use someone like me. You. You. 
dude, I struggle with doubt. I don't know. Listen, I left out just because I didn't want to get into it. You know how the Great Commission starts? Jesus appears to them, it says, some doubted and some worshiped. And Jesus is like, okay, mixed audience. Anyway, go make disciples of all nations. He doesn't seem phased. Your faith is not dependent on your faith. It's dependent on His love for you. So if you're wrestling with doubt, you're like, I could never be. You, me, you. You're the one that Jesus is saying, come on, get up. Get out of your sin. Get out of your old life. Come on, I want to use you. Listen, you have no idea how good life can be in the kingdom of heaven. You, whatever dreams you have, whatever brought you to New York, whatever made you think, oh, this is the place where it's all going to be glorious and released. I want to tell you, it's a drop in the bucket of what God can do through your life. People say, are you ever going to deny your faith? And I say, I just don't think I can. Why? Because I'd be giving up so much. For what? The world? A bit of affirmation? A little bit of sin? I'm living that kingdom life. It's hard. What isn't hard? Life is hard. That's glorious. So I want to say tonight, do you hear Jesus saying to you, come on, it's time to be a disciple? Maybe you've leaned back. Maybe you've been hurt by the church and you're like, I can't trust the church again. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm not asking you to be my disciple. I'm not asking you to trust our church, be our church's disciple. I'm saying start with Jesus and work your way from there. Don't start with your doubts. Just start with God's love. Work your way out from there. So do you sense Jesus calling you tonight? Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian and you feel something honing in on you right now like, oh my gosh, I think God's talking to me. I think He wants me. Yes, He does. Jesus is the most amazing man who's ever lived. He's the central point of human history. Your, date today, your life today, whether you acknowledge Him or know Him or not, is dated by His life and his death and his resurrection. And he has more for you. And so the question is, are you going to let go of whatever your hand is on? You're going to get up from that table and are you going to follow? Folks, our church is asking two questions. Number one, what's our plan for discipleship and is it working? And I want to say this to you, primarily because of, the, because of how great you guys are. It's working. And we want you to be a part of it. It, we've got space for you at the table. Leave the table of sin and feast at the table of kingdom. We've got a seat for you. We'd love to have you join us. So I just want to pray of you tonight, just give you a chance to respond uh, to God's word and uh, maybe the voice of Jesus. Maybe you're not quite sure of how you got to church tonight um, and you're sitting here and you just ca you cannot believe how relevant this feels to you. you. By the way, how do you respond to Jesus? Here's what you say. Okay, I'll follow. That's it. That's the, that's the big step. Leave whatever has been your preoccupation and give yourself over to Him. And so, Father, I just want to say thank you for your word tonight. Jesus, I want to say thank you for entrusting us with your mission. And, Father, I just want to pray right now, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, I want to pray that they would make that eye contact with you where they realize you're talking to them. Holy Spirit, I want to pray right now you would get into the deepest part of who they are. Call them from where they are to where you want them to be. Get up, leave the table, and go with Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight and uh, you've been pretty disengaged, had a wild summer, pretty distracted, and you just hear Jesus say, yeah, come on, come back, let's keep going. Come back. I've got more for you. I want to transform you. I want to fill you with power. I want to use you to love, bless, and serve other people. Just say, Jesus, I'm in again. I'm back. I'm back. And then maybe you're here tonight and uh, you're just, you just want to freshly devote yourself to the person of Jesus. This week, just thinking through these things, I was just in the office. No one was there, just walking around, just saying, I'm all in. Whatever this life is, whoever I am, whatever my gifts are, whatever energy I have, whatever money I have, I throw it at your feet. Use my life, Lord. I know that this is not all that God has and I want every bit of the inheritance Jesus died to give me. So maybe for you, it's just fresh surrender, Lord. Here I am, I'm all in. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just cement in our spirits a vision for being disciples of Jesus. Jesus, we say yes to your invitation. Jesus, we say yes. 
We will leave whatever has been holding us back and we will follow you. Jesus, we will take up our cross daily and follow you. Jesus, we will lose our lives to gain our life. Lord, we will fall into the ground and die that fruit may be born. Jesus, we'll remain in you. Jesus, we'll love like you. Jesus, we'll obey your words, know your words, but we can't do it on our own. So Lord Jesus, you who sent the Holy Spirit to empower your followers, I pray, send your spirit, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of discipleship, release it in our church tonight that we may be more like Christ in the midst of a world who needs it desperately. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Folks, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to close uh, uh, with the worship time here. Uh, I want to say this to you. Uh, while we're standing, if you've sensed God speaking to your heart tonight and uh, you'd like prayer for something, these folks down the front here, these are wonderful folks. They would love to be able to pray for you. I know there can sometimes be power in just making a commitment, just, just coming forward and just saying, pray for me. And uh, maybe, maybe you've made a decision to follow Jesus tonight. You're like, dude, I don't know what to do next, but I just said yes to Jesus. We'd love to be able to pray for you, help you on your journey. Maybe you feel stuck in sin and you want to want to be a disciple, but you don't want to be a disciple. You're torn. And you want someone to just pray for you. Just bring wherever you're at to Jesus and ask Him for mercy. He will meet you and give you power. So don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Everybody comes forward for prayer. Trust me, there's something's going to come up in your life where you won't care what the room thinks and you're just going to come for prayer. So just practice that now while the days are good so it doesn't feel weird when the days get hard. Amen. So anything you need tonight, why don't you come forward? We'd love to be able to pray for you. And let's lean in and respond to Jesus' invitation tonight.